Hey everyone, today I'm going to talk about why you're in pain. Poor technique, muscle imbalances, poor mobility, some other made up bullshit. Stuff like this is always floating around the internet. You're in pain, you're injured, or you're going to get injured because poor technique, muscle imbalances, poor mobility, those are usually the three main culprits. And I'm gonna explain why this is bad information and you should just ignore it. Pain, injury is a complex topic and anytime that you see a black and white, one bullet point reason for why you're experiencing pain, you should be skeptical. Unless I guess, you know, you just chopped your arm off and in which case I can pretty confidently say you're in pain because you just chopped your arm off. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about typical aches, pains, and minor injuries that occur while you're in the gym. All right, let's kick this off. Poor technique causes pain. There are a lot of holes in that statement. If we assume poor technique causes pain, then I guess that means everyone with poor technique is in pain, but that's not the case. I coach beginners all the time, and at first, they have what we would consider poor technique, meaning it's just not very efficient, and they're not in pain. In fact, they train for several months with poor technique, not in pain, and over time, their technique gets better as they practice. So if we're assuming that poor technique causes pain, I guess we can assume that good technique ensures we're pain-free. That's also not the case. I've experienced pain while lifting with good technique. I've hurt myself while lifting with what I would call good technique. I've actually worked with a lot of lifters who have good technique, efficient technique, and they actually obsess over their technique. They record video from multiple angles, they move very slowly as if one wrong twitch and they send themselves to Snap City. They're very obsessive over analytical lifters and some of them get injured often or they experience pain quite often. They're in this perpetual cycle of pain. So maybe pain doesn't correspond with technique as strongly as we like to make it seem. Check this out, I can deadlift with what we would all consider bad technique and not feel any pain. This is probably due to the fact that it's relatively light for me. So maybe it's better to assume that training intensity and load is more closely related to injury risk than just technique alone. And this has been studied along with fatigue being closely related to injury risk. You might argue, sure, you aren't in pain after deadlifting like that right now, but you will be if you continue. And to that, I would argue, not necessarily. If I continued deadlifting just like this for three days a week for the next five years, I would probably adapt to this technique and get pretty good at it. Just like round back deadlifters get good at deadlifting with a round back, which we would call bad technique, bad for your back to round your back. This guy actually performs very round back deadlifts as an assistance movement, and he walks away without any pain at all. And this is all because humans are adaptable. We can move in a variety of different ways. If you stress the body a certain way for long enough, it'll adapt to it. I think it's funny on social media when you see a heavy deadlift with a little bit of back flexion, everyone's in an uproar. But on the same social media, you see someone doing a bent press with a heavy kettlebell and it's functional. And by the way, I'm not talking trash about bent presses. I think it's pretty damn cool. And this guy you're watching is pretty damn strong. Here's Martins Lisi's doing a 560 pound Steinborn squat. Imagine what his spine is going through. This is stuff that makes up a back specialist nightmares. And here comes the squat. If we bring this back to injury prevention, something you can take away from this video, it's important to monitor overall training intensity, load, weight, but it's also important to avoid acute spikes in training load. You're squatting one time a week and you wanna hop straight to small off squats five times per week. That's probably an acute spike in training load. Uh, if we relate it to something other than lifting weights, let's say I wanted to be an MLB pitcher and I went to practice tomorrow and I threw 10 pitches at like 60, 70% of my maximum throwing speed. That would be pretty tolerable. The next day I come in and do 100 pitches, maximum effort, that is an acute spike in training load and probably not a good idea. Let's try to turn this into a relatable scenario. So, the guy in the gym is maxing out, he hurts his back on a max effort, one rep at RP10. And he says, 
yeah, you know, uh, my form slipped up a little bit and that's why I hurt my back. And he might not even be considering the poor programming choices that were made leading up to this point. He might not be considering overall training intensity in his program or acute spikes in training load. He just looks immediately to my technique slipped and I hurt my back. He might not even be paying attention to the fact that stress outside of the gym is at an all time high. He's dragging himself into the gym, trying to find some motivation. He's hopped up on 900 milligrams of caffeine. He's trying to find some motivation at the bottom of this ammonia bottle. Stress outside of the gym, all time high. All of these things play a role in injury, not just technique alone. So training intensity might be worth paying attention to if you're constantly plagued with aches and pains in the gym. Doing five reps <clears throat> at RP10 for five sets across the board rest in 10 minutes in between sets just so you can get another five reps, uh, constantly failing weight. If I was your coach, that's what I would adjust first and foremost. I wouldn't immediately jump to your technique. To be clear, I am not saying that technique doesn't matter. You should try to replicate consistent, efficient, repeatable technique. I don't think that you should try to walk out your max squat on one leg, fall to the floor as fast as possible, and rebound back up because Technique just doesn't matter. I'm just trying to challenge the statement, poor technique causes pain, because I don't think that's necessarily true. And the problem with people saying this is the fact that it can actually cause more harm than good. In a way, it's fear mongering, and it discourages a lot of people from starting weight training. Hey, if your technique isn't perfect, just like I show in my YouTube videos, you're gonna be in pain, or you're gonna get injured, or when you're my age, you're gonna regret lifting like that. Can you imagine a new lifter hearing that and thinking, uh, yeah, I'll just stick to the cardio machines. Sounds pretty intimidating. Or, yeah, you know, I tried weight training once and uh, I was told I have poor technique, so I'm just gonna stop before, you know, uh, I really seriously hurt myself. I wish we would all stop putting up barriers for new lifters, making them less likely to come strength train, come get under a bar and squat. I've heard technique referred to as a spectrum of efficiency, less efficient, less efficient to more efficient, which implies that you can improve. I don't think it's wise to label technique as correct or incorrect because that implies safe, unsafe. Furthermore, I think that always harping on technique is something online coaches do to get their clients to make them feel like they need them. You're, you're in pain, I can fix that. Let me see your technique. You're not making progress, I can fix that. Let me, see your, let me see your technique. Send me lifting videos for the rest of your life because you need me to always correct your technique. And this only makes lifters uh, overly critical of their lifts. They overthink everything. They're always doing something wrong and the gym is no longer an enjoyable place to be. In fact, lifting weights now seems threatening. If I let my technique slip, oh, I'm gonna be in pain, I'm gonna go snap city. So just pay attention to the words that you're using if you're a coach when you're talking about poor technique and pain. If there's more to a simple statement, like poor technique causes pain, don't just make that statement on an infographic and post it on social media. I can already see it down in the comment section, people saying, Alan, bro, chill, it's not that big of a deal. It's just people trying to help each other out. I do think it's a big deal because I work with people and I meet a lot of people who, after talking with them for five minutes, I can see that they, they truly lift in fear. Fear that one wrong move and they're gonna get injured. They're gonna send themselves to Snap City. Or they live under this false belief that I'm constantly plagued with injuries or aches and pains because my technique sucks. And after working with them, I say, your technique is actually pretty good. It's your programming that sucks, but that's for another video. So I think the, my argument here, or the takeaway from this whole topic, if we are trying to get sedentary people to get up and move, I think it's best not to encourage them to get up and move and then immediately box them into these very defined ways of moving. It's okay if your technique is not great at first. Just continue lifting and that will all improve. All right, moving past poor technique, the next thing I commonly hear is, you're in pain or you got injured because of muscle imbalances. And the reason this one's my favorite is because I used to subscribe to this way of thinking. I used to put way too much important on, way too much importance or focus on small muscle imbalances that honestly I was probably just making up in the first place. I used to view the, the body as a, a robot, this machine that had to be in perfect symmetry until I saw adaptive athletes thriving, getting stronger, living full, complete, healthy lives, despite their obvious and very real 
muscle imbalances and asymmetry. And seeing this really challenged my previous way of thinking and, and it got me now thinking, <clears throat> if, if I think my right IT band is tight and that's what's getting me injured or my anterior pelvic tilt is limiting my squat progress, these, these silly limitations that I'm putting on myself, how are these adaptive athletes getting stronger and lifting without any pain. Check this out. So I originally saw Stuart Jamison on Instagram. He was born with spina bifida, defective spinal cord, half a rib cage, and a split in his spinal column. And he still deadlifts 286 kilos, 630 pounds at 132 pounds body weight. This is coming straight from the post on Instagram. So whilst you therapists are fussing over a 0.8 centimeter leg length difference, three degrees of anterior pelvic tilt, upper cross syndrome, and over and active muscles, Stuart is warming up, repping your deadlift showing how robust, resilient, and able the body can be despite not being in perfect alignment, pristine symmetry, or ideal balance. Another example, apparently Usain Bolt, the fastest man on the planet, has scoliosis, causing his right leg to be half an inch shorter than his left leg. And this produces an uneven stride when he runs. His right leg produces 13% more force than his left, and with each stride, his left leg remains on the ground about 14% longer than his right leg. Researchers have said that, quote, our working idea is that he's probably optimized his speed and that asymmetry reflects that. In other words, correcting his asymmetry would not speed him up and might even slow him down. If he were to run symmetrically now, it could be an unnatural gait for him. It's almost as if we don't need to be in perfect symmetry because our bodies are pretty good at adapting to a lot of things, including small asymmetries or big ones. I'm talking about muscle imbalances while doing one arm circus dumbbell press. This seems fitting. Ugh. I actually have some asymmetries, believe it or not. Uh, one of my collarbones is a lot shorter than the other one. I broke it in high school and it healed like this. So, you know, the doctor told me, hey, this collarbone's shorter than the other one. No big deal. When I got my recent DEXA scan done, they actually give you, they list how much muscle you have in each of your limbs, down to the gram. Surprise, my right arm and left arm have different amounts of muscle. My right leg and left leg have different amounts of muscle. It's okay. I feel like these are things that I could dwell on. And when you're searching for a problem and you're searching long enough and hard enough, you'll probably find a problem. And if you don't find it, you'll at least make up a problem. I feel like people say muscle imbalances are so bad because it puts a, an uneven amount of stress on one side of your body versus the other. And I just can't help but wonder, what do you guys think of when you see strongman competitors running with a 200 pound barrel on one side of their body or doing a circus dumbbell press with a 250 pound circus dumbbell one arm? picking up a natural stone that's unevenly weighted. Oh, whatever, I feel like I'm just rambling at this point. Let's move on. Okay, next bullet point. You're in pain because you have poor mobility. Also, another big nope. I work with clients frequently who have been inactive for the past couple of decades and the extent of their mobility demands have been walking and getting up out of a chair. When we start strength training on day one, they're not pushing through a tremendous amount of pain because they lack mobility. We just modify training so that they can actually start tra strength training on day one and go from there. Again, they're not pushing through the, any pain just because they have poor mobility. Over time, their mobility improves as they get frequent exposure to this range of motion and to greater and greater ranges of motion. I'd be doing them a disservice if on day one, I was to say, okay, you got poor mobility, so we can't do any strength training. Go ahead and lay on the ground, lay on this cross ball, do some of these stretches, blah, blah, blah. Once your mobility is good enough, once I think it's good enough, then we can start resistance training, which is just putting up another wall, another barrier for them to start tra strength training on day one. And what would be even better is if I said to them, you have really poor mobility. Are you in a lot of pain? No? I'm surprised. <laughs> By the way, that's 200 bucks for today.
And people will say, anecdotally, like to be fair, I understand, they'll say things like, I don't know, man, I used to have poor mobility and I was in a lot of pain. I improved mo my mobility and now I'm pain free. Or I also hear, I used to be weak and in pain. Now I started deadlifting uh, and I'm stronger. Now I'm not in pain. So deadlifting cured my pain or improving my mobility cured my pain. First off, that's good to hear, but you're not realizing all of the other factors at play here in these two scenarios. Simply moving more, lifting weights and being active is improving your mood, your attitude, how you view yourself. It's improving your self-efficacy. I'm not relying solely on medication or doctors. I'm helping myself. You're challenging previous physical limitations that you set for yourself or maybe someone else uh, set on you. You're no longer avoiding movement, you're encouraging it. All of these things have a profound psychological effect that can help you manage or improve your pain symptoms. All right, that's all I'm gonna say on this topic. Thanks for watching and always remember, Trend on time.